Conservative Member of Parliament Michael Chong has represented the riding of Wellington Halton Hill since 2004. In 2006, he resigned a cabinet position on a point of principle, something we rarely see in this day and age. In 2013, as a backbencher, he introduced the Reform Act, and after a long and winding process, it received royal assent in 2015. In 2017, Michael put his name forward in the conservative leadership race. He is one of three editors of the new book, Turning Parliament Inside Out, Practical Ideas for Reforming Canada's Democracy. Ladies and gentlemen, Michael Chong. I'm delighted to be here tonight with uh, my colleague uh, from the House of Commons, Elizabeth May, and to be with all of you tonight. It's actually wonderful to see such a big crowd out on, a, on an evening, a balmy fall evening, uh, to talk about Canadian democracy. So kudos to each and every one of you for participating. It's wonderful and heartwarming as an elected official, somebody who believes in public service, to see so many people interested and engaged in our democratic process. Now we've been given 20 minutes and tonight I'm going to focus on uh, one particular thing and that is to describe to you one solution as part of many solutions that I think are needed to strengthen our democracy in Ottawa. But before I begin, let me back up a little bit and tell you what I think the problem in Ottawa is. Quite simply, that our system has changed significantly since Confederation. You know, we are this year celebrating the 150th anniversary of Confederation where three provinces of Canada, Nova Scotia, and New Brunswick came together to, find, to form uh, not a unitary state but a confederated state and to establish a new form of government. That also created the Parliament of Canada with all of its uh, conventions and processes and checks and balances on power that have evolved to this day. But the system that we established in 1867 is very different than the system we have today. And what's happened over the past 150 years, some 15 decades, is that our system of government has changed dramatically. In fact, I put to you that the first elected class, if I can use that, of members of parliament who were elected, I believe, next, uh, next month for the first time in 1867 would not recognize the parliament that we have today. Back then, members of parliament directly elected and removed party leaders, including the prime minister. Back then, caucus membership was self-determining. A member of parliament, after consultations with their constituents here in Guelph or in Wellington County, would then decide which caucus they would sit in, liberal conservative, Clear Grit, Liberal, and the various other parties that sat in the House of Commons. Back then, party leaders were truly prima inter paris, first among equals. In other words, they had very few powers that an MP did not already have, and they did not have additional budgets and staffing that they do today. And so over those 15 decades, the system has changed a lot. Another big change that happened is that back then uh, central parties had no say, party leaders had no say on who the party candidate would be here in Guelph. Guelphites determined who would run for each of the prospective parties and nobody from outside of Guelph could interfere with the selection of the Guelph party candidates for each of the local parties. And so after 15 decades, we have a system today which has changed quite a bit. Today, party leaders decide who will be the party candidate in each riding, and every set of elections, whether it's provincial or federal, we go through the shenanigans of the controversies about which candidates are going to be approved by the leader and which candidates are going to be vetoed by the leader. This is true of all, pretty much all parties um, in the House of Commons today. today uh, members of Parliament have very little say in who the party leader will be. That job has been outsourced 
in a presidential style of primary to party members. And today, uh, members of parliament uh, increasingly do not have a say in the day-to-day -day functioning of the House of Commons, and that job has been turned over to what we call recognized parties in the House of Commons, and by extension, party leaders. And so, as a result, we have an immense amount of concentration of power in two or three members of parliament who largely run the show in Ottawa. And that's to the detriment of your voice in Ottawa, in my view, because in the Canadian system, you get one vote at the federal level, and that's for your locally elected member of parliament. And if that role has been diminished, because the power has moved away from that role and into party leaders' offices, then so too has your voice been diminished. And so I think we need to embark on a series of reforms to rebalance power, to restore power back to where it needs to be, which is in the people's directly elected representatives. Now, there are a number of things that I think we should tackle. Some of that I attempted to do with the Reform Act, which was amended and passed in a watered-down form uh, two years ago. Some of it, though, I proposed during the most recent uh, leadership race that we went through. But tonight I want to focus on one particular very tangible measure that we can undertake to restore that balance of power, and that is committee reform. So you were all used to seeing during question period the floor of the House of Commons where 338 MPs gather to debate each other and to participate in question period and the other proceedings of the House. But that isn't where the vast majority of work is done for a typical member of Parliament. The vast majority of work is done in the committee system of the House of Commons. Because the House time is limited, the vast majority of work is delegated to one of the two dozen standing committees of the House of Commons. And this is where three quarters of the work in Ottawa is done. Members of Parliament spend far more time working on in committee than they do uh, on, in working on the floor of the House of Commons. <clears throat> so the functioning of these committees is vitally important if we're going to restore that balance of power. T committees today function in three different areas. They serve three purposes. First, they are the place where government legislation is typically amended. So if legislation is going to be, that the government has put forward is to be amended, it's at committee that that is typically done. It's also the place where, spend, where the government's spending of your tax dollars is to be approved. Um, the delegation, the House of Commons long ago gave up the power to approve government spending in detail. We used to approve government spending as a House of Commons as a whole up to the 1960s, but by that time, because of the growth of government and the social welfare state, it became too cumbersome to review line by line item government spending on the floor of the House of Commons. So that was broken into about two dozen different chunks and delegated to each of the two dozen standing committees of the House of Commons. So that's the second vital role that committees play. They approve government spending. And the third thing that committees do is they hold the government accountable. They hold the Prime Minister and they hold government ministers accountable for their actions of their departments and what they do on a day-to-day -day basis. But unfortunately, the two dozen standing committees of the House of Commons are have in effect become an extension of the Prime Minister's office. And the reason is simple. Today, these committees are made up of 10 members of Parliament. They're apportioned on the balance of the recognized parties in the House of Commons. So today, there are six Liberal members of Parliament representing approximately their take of the 330 seats in the House of Commons, three Conservative members of Parliament representing the approximate 100 seats that the Conservatives have in the House, and one New Democratic seat representing approximately the three dozen seats that they have in the House of Commons. So these 10 members are chosen by the party leaders and sit at the pleasure of the three party leaders. If a member of Parliament on a committee isn't compliant with the leader's wishes, that member will be removed and replaced with another member, and that happens all the time. And as a result, these committees don't function as oversight committees, as independent, autonomous, legislative oversight committees that can review and amend government legislation if there are problems to be found. 
that can review and approve government spending if there are problems to be found, or that will hold ministers, including the prime minister, to account. And the reason for that, as I said, is simple. It's because they are appointed by the three party leaders. Now, in a majority parliament, where six out of the 10 seats are the seats of the party in power, in effect, the prime minister's office and the prime minister himself controls these committees. And that was no different. That's, that's true today, and it was true before the last election when the conservatives held the majority in the House of Commons. And so as a result, it is almost unheard of in Canada for government legislation to be substantially amended by committee. It is unheard of for government spending to be properly reviewed. And it is unheard of for a prime minister to be called into account in front of a parliamentary committee to be held to account. Contrast that and compare that with the United Kingdom's parliament, which is similar in structure to ours, which has similar committees of the House of Commons, but where the Prime Minister and party leaders do not appoint members to committee. In that parliament, government legislation is regularly amended hundreds of times in any given calendar year. The Prime Minister is often hauled in front of committee to explain their actions, most famously a couple years ago when Tony Blair and Gordon Brown were pulled in front of a parliamentary committee uh, to explain their actions with respect to the war in Iraq, and government spending is regularly reviewed. So in order to rebalance power in Ottawa, a very simple change that we could make would be to take away the power of the three party leaders in the House of Commons to appoint the 10 members of each of the two dozen standing committees of the House, and instead give that to your elected representatives members of parliament on a secret ballot vote on the very same day that we elect the Speaker of the House. And in doing so, we would suddenly have 24 committees where 10 members of parliament on each committee would come together, would take their jobs seriously in reviewing government legislation, reviewing government spending, and holding government ministers and departments accountable without having the fear of being pulled off committee because they weren't compliant with the leader's wishes. That's one little change. It doesn't require a federal, provincial minister, first minister's meeting to accomplish this change. It doesn't require a constitutional amendment. It simply requires the will of the 338 members of parliament to amend the standing orders, very simple, up and down, single vote, to amend the standing orders to change the way in which we elect <clears throat> members to committee, giving that power to the House as a whole in a secret ballot vote. And I put to you that if we can accomplish that one little change, we would radically alter the balance of power in Ottawa, make the job of your elected representatives much more meaningful, and actually provide a much greater accountability uh, for the government's actions in Ottawa. There are some other changes that I would suggest with respect to committees. I think it's unfair that all but two or three of the chairs that chair these committees are government chairs. I think the chairs should be apportioned, uh, the chairmanships, the chairwomanships of each of these two dozen committees should be apportioned based on the seats that each party has in the House of the Commons. I also think it's <clears throat> a violation of, increasingly a violation of members' rights. The members of parliament who do not meet the threshold of a recognized party in the House of Commons, which is a group of 12 members of parliament or more, no, do not have the automatic right to sit on committees and to participate in their proceedings. So giving uh, the chairs of the committees in proportion to the parties in the House, uh, making sure that members of parliament who are independents, who don't, aren't members of recognized parties, ensuring that they have a voice on these committees, and a number of other changes should also be considered. So these are, there are, this is just one little change that we can accomplish that we've written about in the book, that put together with the other, the other changes that some of my colleagues have suggested, like Ms. May, would make a tremendous impact on your democracy. And I'll just finish by saying this. I don't have to tell you <clears throat> about the rise of populism, uh, both here and abroad, in recent years. I don't have to tell you um, the instability that we see across the Western world in our politics. But it's precisely at times like this that we need to strengthen our democratic 
set of checks and balances on power. We are just as prone to populist impulses here in Canada as uh, other countries are. We've had the election of populist mayors in this country, we've seen populist elections take place, and we are no less prone to that kind of politics than Americans are or the Brits or Europeans. But the health of our democracy depends on ensuring that no one person has all the power in the room. The strength of our system depends on ensuring that we have a democracy that has democratic checks and balances on power to ensure that power can be contained and power is not misused. And that's why your participation here tonight is so very important. Because our system currently does not have sufficient checks and balances on power. And to date, we've not elected uh, a parliament, we've not had a head of government that has been as blatantly populist as we've seen in other orders of government here in Canada or south of the border. But one day, we might. And when that day comes, we have to ensure that up to that point, we did everything we could to strengthen our system, to return it and restore it to the foundations on which it was created in 1867, to ensure that those populist impulses are checked and balanced. Thank you very much, and I look forward to your questions.